first, I just want to take you through some things to think about for the second round of message box work, right? So the first round was about really honing your message box, thinking about what it is the core of what you want to communicate to your audience is and how to start phrasing that. Um, and then uh, what I want to talk about now is making your messages stick. Um, one of the things that is really helpful, as you saw with the Jenna Jamback example, is that the right kind and level of detail can help make concepts more concrete, right? So one of the things, and I can't remember if it's in the first or the second clip, but Christopher Joyce actually talks about her methods, right? The researchers went out and picked up trash off the beach, right? So somewhere along the lines, she talked about how she actually did her work, but she did it in a way that he really understood, right? And could, could then communicate to his audience. Um, so you want to be descriptive. You want to tell journalists what you've seen and heard, right? She talked about how she walks around and takes pictures of trash cans. It's like, what does observing waste management streams look like? <laughs> this is what I do, right? So thinking about how you can use visual metaphors um, and even just really vivid descriptions to paint a picture of the phenomena or process or findings that you're talking about can be really helpful. Um, so, uh, you know, using facts and statistics sparingly, not 26 different ones, but one, right? One simple statistic really drove that message for Jenna. Using examples, um, especially local examples or examples that are relevant to whatever scale um, you are communicating at. If it's a state level example, if you're talking to people in California, think about something that is really gonna resonate with folks in California. If you're thinking nationally, something a little bit larger scale might be more relevant, right? Um, any anecdotes you have, especially descriptions of like what happens in the field. Um, those are really great stories and tidbits to kind of be able to use as vehicles for your facts. Um, metaphors, which we'll talk about in a second, and also, you know, don't be afraid of sound bites. Um, sound bites really get a bad rap, but they can be a really effective way to convey a concept in a way that is both memorable and meaningful for people. Um, so this is a great example. Um, conservation without monitoring is like a plane without an altimeter. We can't really know where we are. How hard is it to communicate why monitoring matters to people? It's one of the most, it was one of the hardest things to get funding for, right? Why does monitoring matter? Why do you need post-project monitoring? Otherwise, how are we gonna know what happened? Or what's, what's going to happen if you need to do baseline monitoring? So really, really good metaphors can be uh, really helpful. This is another really great one. Um, Jay, I'm totally gonna say his last name wrong, uh, Femi Glit, shoot, I totally fumbled it already. Um, Femi Glietti, I think. Um, so he's a UC Irvine professor and senior water scientist at NASA. And he actually came to a Compass workshop on California water a few years ago. And he was uh, getting ready to go out on this book tour and was trying to come up with metaphors to talk about his work and he just wrestled and wrestled with it for I think it was like a two and a half day workshop and he ultimately landed on something which we will play now. And so so what's happening in California uh, you know our our water system sort of works like this we have uh, snow and, and, and rain no, that, we are, don't. that are that are like the problem. income right they're like the income right our reservoirs right. are like the checking account right, right? and oh. then the groundwater right. is like a long-term reserve Right. So we have no income right now, right? right? The checking account, the reservoirs are running out, That's right? They don't, they're only gonna hold, if they're only for short term, like a real checking account, they're only for short term storage. And so we're hitting that groundwater really, really hard and it's disappearing really, really rapidly. I understand some places the, the, the ground sinks. Because that's right, we take that's right. And that's, it's like, it's like letting, it's like letting uh, the air out of a bicycle or, or uh, a car tire. But it deflates. So. Um, what did y'all think of those metaphors? 
right? And you could hear it in Bill Maher's voice. Like, he was like, oh, like now I get it, right? And that's what you're going for when you come up with that really great metaphor that you can use that can help communicate this really complex thing, right? Like talking about precipitation and groundwater and surface water and exchanges between them and how they relate is really complex and technical, right? And there's a lot of different, like, and, um, really nuances that you could get into, right? It matters about the system and like what the plants are doing and all this, but that doesn't matter to this audience. And the point that Jay wanted to make was just talking about what it is that these different um, kind of buckets of water, so to speak, these different parts of the water budget, um, what they mean and why they matter. So um, that's a, a great one, I think. And the point of talking about Jay grappling with this, of showing Jenna's example of like where she was and where she got to, is that good science communicators are made. They are not born. Science communication is not innate. It's a learned skill. Just like all of the science skills that you have now as a researcher or an educator, science communication is a different skill set that you have to work at. The other thing I want to talk about is framing. So uh, what are frames? Frames are interpretive storylines that communicate what is at stake and why the issues matter. Right, so you've already identified what it is that's at stake and why the issues matter in your message box. The frame is how you piece those together. And so this was uh, referenced earlier, right? Very often when scientists complain about the way their stories were covered, it's because they're, they've not delivered any message and left the journalist to think up one, them, one themselves, right? If you just give the journalist information, they're gonna have to piece together a story that makes sense for them and then figure out how to communicate that to their audience. So um, if effective framing is key, what do you do to figure out what the frame is, right? How can you do this? A key piece of framing is being positive, finding wins. What in this, you know, terrible situation, what is it that is the, the light at the end of the tunnel that gives people something to look to? You need to acknowledge values, right? Again, be explicit about, you know, where you're coming from and where you know or think your audience is coming from. Give local examples, right? That really helps make it relevant and resonant to the people that you're talking to. And again, make it visual. Give them something that they can put in their mind's eye. And again, remember that word choice matters. And again, you need to provide framing because you're only giving your audience, whether it's a journalist, a policymaker, or someone else, you're only giving them a snapshot of your work, right? So you need to provide framing so that they can understand what's going on in that snapshot without all of the background knowledge and context that you have stored up in your brain. Okay, so now you are gonna do a second round of work with your message box. You'll have five minutes of solo work time. Start thinking about you know, some metaphors you might play with, um, different analogies, uh, different frames you might use um, for your particular audience. You'll have five minutes and then we'll do another pair and share and we'll have you pair with someone different to the